Oh, Father in heaven, we thank you for the truths that we can sing and worship to you, Lord, that we can direct our hearts and our thoughts away from ourselves and even away from the life and all of the difficulties here. We can direct them to you. We can lay out our supplications before you. We can express our wonder and amazement at you. We can worship you. We can glorify you. How helpful that is for our souls and how pleasing it is to you. Father, I pray now that you would go before us as we continue in worship because our Bibles are going to be open and that's the revelation of you. And we want to see you. We want to know you. We want to know the kind of God you are. So, Father, go before us and prepare us for what we will see, what we will take in. Father, may there not be a hard heart, but may your word soften and like a scalpel go all the way to the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts and bring the the balm of the gospel to each one of us. Open our eyes that we may behold wonderful things about you. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Let's take our Bibles and let's open them up to Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. And as you are turning to Romans chapter 3, verse 21, um, I want to just say um, they're not expecting it at all, but Kimberly... Thank you and family for coming. It is so good to see you and it's good to have you here and it's good for us to be with you. Thank you for coming. We love you. Um, John, Kimberly's husband and the kid's dad went to be with the Lord on June 19th, a little over a month ago. And um, we rejoice knowing that he is with his savior that he loved and we weep with you and we walk this path together with you too. It's good to have you here. We love you guys. Romans chapter 3. There's no greater thing we could look at today than this glorious good news. But before we do, I want to lay out a scene for you from January of 1981. A plane has landed and taxied to a stop. The door of the plane opens, and down the stairs come... 52 passengers. A crowd is waiting below on the tarmac and they are cheering. You probably have an image in your mind of that event that I just described for you. You can grasp that scene and you can grasp it to a point. But there is so much, much more to that scene. And what will help you grasp the full meaning of that scene is the context, the history prior to that scene. You see, about 450 days prior to that scene, on November 4th, 1979, all of these 52 passengers on that plane were in the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, Iran. And Iranian students stormed that embassy and they took all within that embassy hostage for 444 days. But when a new president was sworn into office in the United States in January of 1981, Ronald Reagan, these 52 remaining hostages were set free. And so you see, a plane landed and a taxied to a stop on the tarmac and the door opened and down the stairs from the plane came 52 passengers And there was a crowd waiting below, cheering. Now you can grasp the full meaning of that scene at the airport in January of 1981. Without the prior terrible context, there's meaning in the event. But the full depth of the meaning, the full depth of the celebration isn't as clear. And so let me read for you once again 
the passage that we have been in now for four Sundays, Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. I want you to see this scene, this salvation scene. But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This passage, this salvation scene, is, it's a great scene. It is loaded with meaning that we will be trying to discover for the rest of our lives. But the same could be said here as well, that the depth of the meaning of this great gospel salvation scene, it can't be fully appreciated without knowing the truly awful bad news of the scene before it in Romans. So the better your grasp is of the prior context, the better your grasp will be on this passage. So I want to review again just briefly Romans 1.18 to 3.20 so that you understand that's all the bad news scene of the gospel. And it is far worse than being a hostage in Iran in the late 70s and early 80s, as bad as that was. Romans 1.18 to 3.20 tells us that all of mankind is unrighteous. And as such, we are all under the reign of sin, Romans 3.9. And as such, we are all under the present, current wrath of God, Romans 1, 24 and 26 and 28 say that. And we are told that we are unrighteous in every way possible. We are filled with all unrighteousness, Romans 1, 29. And we are unrighteous by choice. We have no desire to change it. And so there is no other response from a righteous God against unrighteous people like that except a wrathful response, a righteous response wrathful response. And this prior context also tells us that there are absolutely no exceptions among any of us, among us all. No one has distinguished himself as being better than the rest or above the rest. It's the testimony of the gospel about all of mankind. Personally, individually, you are under the reign of sin and under God's wrath. But also collectively, Equally, we are all under that same reign of sin and under God's wrath. And the gospel labors to bring you into agreement with both of those things. This prior scene before Romans chapter 3, verse 21, it takes you all the way to your unrighteous, enslaved, wrathful, dead end, and the gospel leaves you there without a word to speak, without anything to say. The gospel leads you there so that you will no longer protest against all the, that, that all-encompassing indictment against you and against us all, that we are under the reign of sin, our mouths need to be closed, that we are under the wrath of God, our, our mouths need to be closed, that we cannot distinguish ourselves from one another by trying to behave better than the rest. We need to have our mouths closed. The gospel spells out the scene this way, that every mouth must be closed, Romans chapter 3, verse 19. We must be brought by the gospel into silent agreement with it concerning the gospel's indictment against us all. Why? Because as long as we shake a fist 
at this indictment and the God who gives it and the gospel who gives it. As long as we shake a fist at it and say, no, I'm, I'm a cut above the rest. You watch. Watch what I can do. As long as we are that way, we will never receive the good news of Romans 3, 21 through 26. We will not receive the good news that God's righteous status is freely given by grace through faith to unrighteous sinners like us. That's what Romans 3, 21 through 26 is all about. What we need most as unrighteous sinners is God's very righteous status. All I have ever been, all you will ever be without Jesus Christ is unrighteous. It's all you can be, have been. And all God has ever been is the opposite. All he ever will be is the opposite perfectly righteous. And he is righteous with the only righteousness that pleases him, that he blesses when he sees, that he rejoices over to see, that he accepts. And the good news is he declares his righteousness, that righteousness, over the life of an unrighteous sinner by faith. That is the good news of the gospel. God freely gives his own righteous status to unrighteous sinners in salvation as a gift by grace through faith. And to grasp the fullness of this, you need to understand that you're not a pretty okay person but you are unrighteous, and so am I. And we are under the wrath of God. And we cannot do anything to distinguish ourselves or to make us uh, separate into a new group of exceptional people than the rest. So let's finish our study of this great righteousness of God for all those who believe in Jesus Christ. We've been taking it one feature at a time. We'll review the first six that we've already done, and then we'll finish with one last one today, number seven. The first gospel feature of God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners like us in salvation is this. Number one, God's righteous status is found entirely separate from our works. Let's even back up to verse 20. By works of law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. That's just the way he sees it as a righteous God. No flesh will be justified by works of law in his sight. Verse 21, but now apart from law, apart from works of law, righteousness, the righteousness of God has been manifested. It's been revealed. You see, we're just the wrong kind of people to try to put law into our lives and change it ourselves. All we could ever touch with unrighteous hands will only become unclean itself and will remain unclean, and it will not be impressive to God. In fact, it only makes him angry. God's righteous status, number one, is found entirely separate from our works. The second feature of God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners in salvation is the Old Testament testifies in agreement with God's righteous status in the gospel. Verse 21, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. You see, the gospel is making the claim. It's a staggering claim. The gospel is making the claim that God's righteous status is not manifested. It's not revealed through your good works or through mine. And the Old Testament testifies in agreement with the gospel on this matter. Actually, this is a great statement on the unity of your Bible. Your Older Testament, your Newer Testament are in complete agreement on where God's righteous status is not found. It's not found in regards to your good works or in connection with your good works. It never could be. Your Older Testament and your New Testament are not in conflict on this. They are in agreement. The Old Testament testifies in agreement with God's righteous status in the gospel. The third gospel feature of God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners in salvation is, number four, faith in Jesus is the instrument through which God's righteous status comes. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. The righteous status of God 
that will have absolutely nothing to do with your good works or with mine is revealed only through faith in Jesus Christ. And that is truly humbling for any unrighteous sinner like us, like we are, to accept. All we can ever produce from ourselves is unrighteousness, as we've said. The gospel says that about us. And the gospel also tells us that if we, in that unrighteous condition, even try to add law to our lives to reform ourselves, two things are true. One, we will not distinguish ourselves from the rest. And even more importantly, number two, God's righteous status will never come to us that way. Never. The gospel simply says, in your unrighteous condition, believe Jesus. And through faith, God's righteous status is declared, is given. Faith in Jesus is the instrument through which God's righteous status comes. The fourth gospel feature of God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners in salvation is faith in Jesus is the one hope for all unrighteous sinners. Verse 22, the end, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This explains why faith is the only instrument through which God's righteous status comes for all who believe. It is because there's no distinction. No one has distinguished himself in such a way that faith in Jesus is not the solution for him. And why is that the case? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The gospel in Romans 1.18 to 3.20 has made it clear that there is a one-size-fits-all problem and indictment with unrighteous sinners, over unrighteous sinners, And not one can separate himself off so as to need a different remedy. Well, God has to save all of these through faith. But this one, wow, have you seen this one? He's got a different plan for that one. No one has ever done that. And therefore, the gospel is now revealing and making it very clear that the one-size-fits-all problem has a one-size-fits-all solution. It is faith for everyone who believes. Faith in Jesus is the one hope for all unrighteous sinners. The fifth gospel feature of God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners in salvation is God's righteous status or justification is God's gift by grace. Verse 24, being justified as a gift by his grace. Being justified is precisely what Paul has been talking about in the prior verses. A righteous status that is not tied to works is being justified. That's what being justified is. A righteous status that does come through faith, that's what being justified is. Being declared by God to have his very own righteous status through faith in Jesus Christ, even though you've only ever been unrighteous yourself. Being justified is something primarily positive for the unrighteous believer. It means possessing God's righteous status over your life, even though you've only ever been unrighteous. And so when God looks on you with his status of righteousness declared over you, God sees credited to your account what he has been for all of eternity. He sees over you what he is moment by moment by moment by moment. He sees credited to your account what he does every moment of of eternity and life and time. He sees what brings him joy when he looks at you. If you're a believer, he sees declared over you what he blesses when he sees it. And he treats you on the basis of his righteousness that he gave you through faith. And therefore, what favor you have in his sight because of his own righteousness, even though you're unrighteous. It's a gift by grace. God's righteous status or justification is God's gift by grace. The sixth gospel feature of God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners in salvation is, number six, Christ's ransom payment is the means through which God's righteous status comes. The last part of verse 24, it comes, this being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. 
redemption. To redeem means to set free as a to set free a prisoner or a slave by paying a ransom price. And that is what we certainly need, being those who are under sin, under the reign of sin, Romans 3, 9. What God is revealing here about his saving work is that justification comes to you through the redeeming work of Christ at the cross when he shed his blood. Christ's redemption, it's the instrument, it's the means, it's the vehicle, it's the pathway through which our justification comes. You see, there's a very, very close relationship between us being given God's status of righteousness and us being set free from our sin through Christ's death. So try to wrap your mind around what this means about God, the kind of God who saves sinners. He will declare, uh, he, he will not, excuse me, he will not declare you righteous through faith, yet leave you a slave under the reign of your sin. He won't do that. And he will not free you from your sin at the price of Christ's blood, and yet leave you without his righteous status. God takes care of both of those things. And this redemption for us, it is in a person, it is in Christ Jesus. Our redemption is in the one who died at the cross and in the one who was buried and in the one who was raised from the dead and in the one who has ascended to the right hand of the Father and to the, in the one who is interceding for us even now at the Father's side and in the one who will come back to get us and when we see him, we will say our redemption is drawing near. You see, as long as Jesus Christ is, so is your freedom from sin. That's pretty comforting. So Christ's ransom payment is the means through which God's righteous status comes. And that leads us to the last one, the last gospel feature of God's righteous status for unrighteous sinners in salvation. And it's this, and it's, it's a big one. It's two verses here. We're going to look at this today. Christ's wrath-satisfying death finally proved God's justice and God's justifying work concerning believers. Christ's wrath-satisfying death finally proved God's justice and God's justifying work concerning believers. Paul just mentioned at the end of verse 24, Christ Jesus, and now Paul wants to even expand on Jesus and his role in the salvation of sinners. Look at verse 25, whom, this Jesus Christ, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. Now, I want you to see how God-focused, how God-centered this statement is, because you can just read over it and kind of not think carefully about each word. God displayed publicly, Jesus. In fact, the voice of the verb is probably in the middle voice, which means God displayed publicly for God, Jesus. So God is acting, and God is doing this for God. This is all for God. In fact, the way to say it is God is acting for God with God the Son. God is acting for God with God the Son. You tell me, who's the focal point of the cross? It's God. The only good works that save are God's good works, which save sinners. And this achievement of God, it has to be seen, it has to be taken in. God is acting for God with God, but he's not doing it over in a corner. He's not doing it in a private club. This must be seen. It has to be taken in so that there will be no doubt from anybody looking in just what it is that God is concerned to achieve for God with God the Son. Well, what must be seen? It is that, it is that God's Son is a propitiation God displayed Jesus publicly as a propitiation in his blood. That's our next really important word that belongs to us uniquely as Christians, right? It doesn't belong only to theologians. Propitiation doesn't belong to 
professors and to uh, Bible teachers and pastors and elders. It belongs to Christians. Paul is writing in the first century to non-professor, non-theologian-like believers, although we are all theologians, whether you know it or not. This is our word, and you've got to understand what this word means because your soul depends on it as a believer. Propitiation in the New Testament is this. It is the bloody, wrath-satisfying death of the substitute Jesus. Propitiation is the bloody, wrath-satisfying death of the substitute Jesus. See, he was a, it was a propitiation. His son is in his blood. This word only makes sense against the backdrop of God's wrath. There's no need for a bloody death of a substitute if God is not righteously angry with sin. But he is. And so I want to remind ourselves of what the gospel has already told us in Romans chapter 1 about God's wrath. Go back to Romans 1 verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed currently. It is revealed from heaven. And so just a, real, just a little sidestep here. God's wrath, God's anger isn't like yours and it's not like mine. It's from holy heaven. My anger is laced with sin over and over, not his. He is not, he, he is not a, having an outburst of unrighteous anger. This is righteous, pure anger and wrath coming from holy heaven. It is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Present wrath being revealed against all. Not one ungodly thought, not one unrighteous attitude or act escapes his wrath right now. That's demonstrated in verses 24, 26, and 28, how God um, is presently dispensing his wrath against us all as he takes his righteous, judicial, holy hand, he puts it on the back of our collar, and he gives us over into the prison of our unrighteousness. Verse 32, those who practice such things are worthy of death. We are worthy of the death sentence of God's wrath. What about chapter 2? Look at verse 2. And we know, we know, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things that are mentioned in chapter 1. We know this. It is right. It rightly falls. You see, it's from heaven. It rightly falls from heaven. Verse 5, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and, wrath and the revelation of righteous judgment of God. We're storing it up even now for that day later that is coming. Verse 6, he is the God who will render to each person according to his deeds. It's a very personal judgment that's coming in the future. Verse 11, and when he does it, there is no partiality with God. He will not make distinctions among us, divide us up. Verse 16, there is coming a day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. A future day of judgment and wrath is coming. Chapter 3, verse 5, but if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? The God who inflicts wrath is not unrighteous, is he? I'm speaking in human terms. May it never be. The one who inflicts wrath is indeed righteous. That's Paul's point. Verse 6, for otherwise, how will God judge the world? We all know that he is going to judge the world, an all-encompassing judgment. And verse 19, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed and all the world become accountable to God. Listen, God is wrathful, righteously so against us all. There's no partiality shown by him. There are no exceptions in his mind. There are no distinctions. Whatever distinctions we imagine we might possess, they have no influence on him, no effect on him. Your greatest threat as a human being is the wrath of God. The wrath of a just God. God's righteous judgment will engulf your own unrighteousness. 
And so understand this. God's work in salvation, what we're learning in verses 25 and 26 of chapter 3, is that God has a very multidimensional achievement and work that he is doing in salvation. I mean, we learned that, that there's justification, that for any unrighteous sinner to be saved, God must give to that one his own righteous status through faith alone. How can any unrighteous sinner ever have a relationship with the righteous God without God's righteous status? How can that be? That's why there's justification, and God provides that. There's also redemption. This is God's second kind of achievement, dimension in salvation. For any unrighteous sinner under the reign of sin to be saved, God has to set free that unrighteous sinner from the reign of sin by the blood of Jesus. How can any unrighteous sinner be saved without redemption? And now we're learning, thirdly, propitiation. This can't be left out of your salvation or what you understand your salvation to be. A righteous God must also be propitiated. How can any unrighteous sinner under God's current wrath and who is headed for the day of his wrath be saved unless God satisfies his justice against that one? How? How does that become a reality for the unrighteous sinner? Look down at verse 25. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood, what? Through faith. Through faith. What a mercy. What a mercy from God because the only other option for God's wrath to be satisfied is through hell forever. God satisfying his own wrath. It doesn't connect to an unrighteous sinner under his wrath apart from faith. It is through faith. Where you see faith being exercised by an unrighteous sinner, faith in Jesus Christ, through that faith, God's propitiation is connected. It is operative in that unrighteous sinner. Where you see faith in Jesus Christ, you know God's wrath is satisfied there because God displayed publicly Jesus as a propitiation in his blood through faith. One has said, propitiation cannot be had without blood. And yet propitiation is not operative without faith. Propitiation may be made, but it avails me nothing until I believe. And so the two elements must be present to have propitiation and to have it operative. First, the propitiation. Jesus Christ, he must be slain. His blood must be shed. Then there must be faith in him. And this is your only hope before a God who is righteously angry from heaven. He's righteously anger, angry with you as an unrighteous sinner. And here's the best news of all. He doesn't put the burden on you to resolve the problem. Because God acted for God with God to take care of it. The gospel calls you to believe Jesus Christ. And it's not a suggestion to believe. It's a command from God in the gospel to believe Jesus Christ. And in so doing, God's propitiation of his own wrath is operative through faith. So let's try to think a little bit more about justification, redemption, and propitiation. We, we said, he will not give you his righteous status through faith and yet leave you a slave under the reign of sin, right? It's true. And he will not free you from your sin, yet leave you unrobed without his righteous status. And he will not do either of those and yet remain angry against your unrighteousness. He won't declare you righteous with his status of righteousness and stay angry with your unrighteousness. And he won't set you free from your sin and yet remain 
angry. All of this goes together, and he does it all. There's more. God is concerned with the bloody death of his son Jesus to satisfy his wrath against you, believer. He's very concerned what care he has for you and for me, what mercy he has for us, what willingness to sacrifice for you. God was concerned for you. He's concerned for us with the bloody death of his son, but with the bloody death of his son, God is concerned for his reputation as well. Verse 25, this was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. God acted for God. All I know is that when I act for me, with me, nobody benefits in my home. Nobody. Just ask them. But thank God that with the bloody death of his son, God didn't have to choose if, if he'd achieve something for my good or if he'd defend his character. Thank God that with the bloody death of his son, God indeed undoubtedly achieved good for us who believe and he demonstrated his righteous character. That is the idea of Romans 3, 25 and 26. To demonstrate his righteousness. This, this is a reference to his righteousness as an attribute. He wanted, through the bloody death of his substitute son, to prove that he was a righteous God. He wanted, through that death, to do that. Jesus bled and Jesus died on the cross. And while that was happening, God was proving he was righteous. In what sense was he proving that he was righteous? Well, verse 25, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. The focal point historically in the gospel argument right here is the bloody death of Jesus Christ. So let's start with what Paul was talking about. He said that happened prior to it. There were sins previously committed. These are sins previously committed before the death of Jesus, but that had an ongoing lingering effect, according to God. It's, it's in the perfect tense, this these sins previously committed. That means they were committed and there's this ongoing effect of them. That's the way God sees them. So what did God do? What did he do in regards to those earlier previously committed sins against him? It says, in the forbearance of God, he passed over them. Forbearance means God patiently was holding back his wrath against those previously committed sins of those who were trusting in propitiation. Let me give you some examples. So Abel, who's a believer, according to Hebrews 11, he came with a sacrifice in Genesis 4 as a sinner, and God was forbearing. He was holding back his wrath against those sins committed, and God passed over them. He did not satisfy his wrath provoked by the sins of Abel. Let me give you another example. Noah. Noah was a believer who sinned, and God was forbearing. He was patiently holding back his wrath against Noah, and he passed over Noah's sin. He did not satisfy his wrath provoked because of the sins of Noah. We all know Abraham was a believer, but Abraham sinned against God too. And God was righteously angry against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men, including Abraham's. But God was forbearing. He was patiently holding back his wrath. And he passed over Abraham's sins. 
that provoked him. We could go on with Moses. We could go on with Samuel. Let's talk about David, an amazing believer, an amazing sinner. He sinned boldly against God. And yet God did not satisfy his wrath provoked by the sins of David. He was patiently holding back his wrath, passing over the sins of David. All of these came to God with the blood of a substitute in their worship. But we know that the blood of bulls and goats, what? Do not take away sin. What do you call that passing over of sins previously committed? Well, you call it the forbearance of God. So understand what's at stake here concerning God's reputation. He was exercising all along, displaying this, this attribute, this dimension of his character, forbearance. And that left the world wondering as they looked on sinful believers. Hmm. God says he's holy. God says he's righteous. But they sin and they keep living. Is there God, the God that says, in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die? In the day, you'll surely die? Is that their God? Is he just? Is he righteous? Is that God just blowing smoke concerning sin? By being forbearing in this way where he's patiently holding back his wrath, God allowed his reputation to be misinterpreted and misunderstood. The bloody death of Jesus at the cross puts any and every misinterpretation or doubt concerning God's righteousness to rest concerning sins previously committed because the propitiatory death of Jesus was to demonstrate his righteousness. He was righteous in his character. He is righteous in his character. His forbearance in passing over sins previously committed should in no way lead anyone to wonder if God is really serious about sin or not, punishing sin or not. Just look at the crushing of God's own son at the cross. For 4,000 years from Adam to Christ, misinterpretation, misunderstanding about God's character, it could exist. But the gospel's testimony is this, don't doubt it any longer. Don't doubt any longer if God will punish sin or not. Look at Jesus at the cross. God hates sin. And he crushed his son in order to satisfy his righteous wrath against those who believed Yahweh. It's a propitiation through faith. Finally, the blood that takes away sin was shed and satisfied the wrath of God through faith. Yahweh came. Yahweh took on flesh and blood, and God the Son propitiated God the Father. And in that death, God's righteous character was cleared and vindicated, not according to Paul, according to God. And as I said earlier, there is another way that God could have proved his righteous character. One has described it this way. He could, with every sin committed, execute his righteous wrath on the spot. He could. When a man sinned, he, he could have destroyed him. And wrath from heaven would have been just and righteous in doing so. But then, no one would be saved. 
no one would be saved. So God's attribute of forbearance is not being shown to cast doubt on God's other attribute of righteousness. Actually, God's attribute of forbearance is being exercised to reveal God's saving heart. He's patiently holding back his wrath. To pass over sins until the public display that he has purposed, until the demonstration of his righteous judgment can happen at the cross, he's holding back. The cross is the proof of his unwavering, inflexible, uncompromising, holy, righteous justice. This is for the demonstration, verse 26, I say of his righteousness at the present time. Paul lived at a time when it would have been helpful to understand not long after the period of Christ's death to give thought to all of those believers in Yahweh be before the cross. What about all those sins previously committed? Here we are 2,000 years later after the cross. It's hard for us to think of it that way. But we who live post-cross, cross, we should have no doubt that God will crush sinners because of their sin. We shouldn't have any doubt as we look back. Look what he did to his son for believers. And if he did that for our sin as believers, what do you think he's going to do with unbelievers who reject the substitute? Believer, I've been trying to grasp this for myself. Believer, do you see how serious God is with your sin? We sin, we feel badly about it, we confess it, we plead with God for grace to repent of it and to forsake it, and then we do it again and again and again. If we could only understand, if we could only feel what God is against sin and what God does in response to our sin, this is why we must look back at the cross over and over and over because it reveals not just our salvation, not just our redemption, not just our justification. It reveals our propitiation too. It does all of those things and we should look to the cross to remember those things, but it also demonstrates to us clearly that God is righteous and that he is just against the sins that we have committed. Jesus was crushed to satisfy God's wrath against us. And through faith, that is a reality for us. And again, if God's righteousness led him to crush his substitute son in the place of believers, what will God's righteousness lead him to do with the one who rejects his substitute I don't know if you notice what the gospel is doing here. The gospel isn't just about good news for you. Oh, it is, and it's amazing. It's the best news ever. But the gospel is also about God removing every cloud of doubt or confusion about his righteousness. It's about his reputation, too. And praise God again, he didn't have to pick between whether or not he was going to establish and demonstrate fully his righteousness, his justice, or if he was going to declare us righteous by faith. Because the bloody propitiatory death of Jesus is the one and only place that accomplishes both of these glorious ends for God. He did this, verse 26, so that he would be just. Let there be no doubt in your mind if God is just or not. He did this with his son. God acted for God, with God, so that he would be seen to be just. And the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Jesus. 
Humanity, therefore, on the basis of this, is divided into two fearful, awful, sobering categories concerning God's righteous wrath. That will be satisfied. His wrath will be satisfied. He doesn't take sin and just sweep it under a rug. He's not your grandpa on a rocking chair. Pardoning in a kind of passing of the hand the, the, the imperfections and mistakes of a grandson or granddaughter. God's righteous wrath will be satisfied. On one hand, it's satisfied for those who believe that God acted for God with God the Son at the cross. Satisfied. God satisfied his wrath against those who believe, who believe Jesus, that he is the bloody death, and that his bloody death as a substitute is the satisfaction of God's wrath. The only other category of humanity in which God will be satisfied with his wrath is the rest who refuse the substitute Jesus. And they will pay. They will pay the penalty for eternity under God's Wrath in hell. Do you know right now which one you're in? The only difference between the two categories of humanity there is faith. Because there is no distinction. No one gets into the category of satisfied wrath through the sun because they were better than the rest. Because they really had something to show God. No. As a gift, by grace, God brought to them faith. And they believed. And his wrath was satisfied. The only difference is faith. And so the call in the gospel, the command in the gospel from God, his good news for you is to believe. Now, believe. Let's pray. Why don't you just take a moment in the quietness of your own heart where you are and cry out to him the things that are on your mind and on your heart from his word. Reflect back on the cross and the one crushed, yet crushed there. Heavenly Father, I feel like I understand better what Paul is going to say in the next verse. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Father, no one can boast whose sins have been forgiven. No one can boast who is robed in your righteousness. No one can boast for whom your wrath has been satisfied. This is all a gift by your grace. Thank you for being the kind of God that you are, a forbearing God 
a God of mercy, a God of love, a patient God. Oh, how you have ex- displayed long suffering. And Father, we do not even need to be afraid that you are a righteous God. It's awesome. But even that attribute of yours, you are willing with your love in your son to fulfill and let it get its day that it deserves to have. What a foolish idea it is for any of us to think we could do something to try to be winsome in your eyes. Who can take care of all these kinds of things? Only you. Because God, you acted for yourself, with yourself, your son. Thank you for doing that. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.